Welcome to Stagecoach Podcast, where you will find the best Western books on the market. This podcast is brought to you from Dusty Saddle Publishing, also referred to as DSP. The home of Western excellence, where around the world people still enjoy the Old West, and DSP works hard to provide great Western novels for readers to enjoy. First, let's dive into the plot. Finn Sullivan continues his adventures in the beautiful but unforgiving American West in this continuation of his exploits, featured in Finn Sullivan, Mountain Man Wolverine. Finn and his loyal youth partner, Little Dove, find themselves on the dark, dangerous trail of a sadistic, cold-blooded Assiniboine Indian appropriately named Rattlesnake. Along this mission, they meet new folks from far-off lands and find themselves in more than a little bit of trouble. Will they catch up to the murderous, poisonous rattlesnake, or will they succumb to the punishing West before exacting justice? In this episode, we'll be reading Finn Sullivan, Mountain Man, Rattlesnake, Book 2, by author Scotty V. Casper. This is Part 2. Without further ado, join us as we read Chapter 6, Justifiable Homicide. Finn and Little Dove spent the remainder of that day building a cradleboard so Little Dove could carry Azure on her back. They fashioned a flatboard that was about a foot wide. Finn chopped it out of the trunk of a spruce tree, and then he spent a long time smoothing it out by sanding it with a chunk of lava rock. They used rawhide to fashion the sides that was laced together with sign. Finn and Little Dove added a footrest and sewed in head protection. Some Indian cradleboards are decorated in colorful designs with geometric patterns, but their cradleboard was plain but functional. It would create a warm, safe haven for Azure. Thanks for helping me with this, Little Dove said. It will work perfectly for our baby. When I am not carrying her on my back, we can lean it against a tree or a boulder, and it will keep her warm and safe. My pleasure, Little Dove. Remember, we are a team. The next morning came warm and sunny. Finn looked to Oliver. Which direction do you think Rattlesnake went? Did he head north back to the Assiniboine village with his booty? Or did he head south in hopes of finding more wagon trains to attack? That's easy. Those oxen will leave a trail even a child could follow. But I bet the evil bastard headed south. Of course, Finn said. Let's ride and see if we can pick up their sign. It didn't take long, and they indeed found that Rattlesnake was heading south. He probably figures on finding another wagon train and staking out the oxen on good grass while they make their raid. I'm sure that's it, Oliver said. That makes it just perfect for me, because the rendezvous is south of here. I'm way early for it. So if Rattlesnake bypasses the site of the rendezvous, I'll travel on with you and help you kill him. That's nice of you, but I can to let you do that. It's not your fight. Besides, you might get killed. Oliver smiled. Don't worry about it. We're partners, aren't we? Before they hit the trail, Azure started fussing. Let's hold off getting on Rattlesnake's trail for a few minutes because I need to feed our baby, Little Dove said. The poor little thing, Oliver said, and he walked over and lifted Azure out of the new cradle board and kissed her on the forehead. Then he put Azure under his chin and snuggled with her while he rocked back and forth to comfort her and see if he could stop her from crying. It was a sight to see, a huge, gnarly mountain man treating a baby with such tenderness. Oliver was a little over six feet tall, and he must have weighed 250 pounds. He was 40 years old, and his massive beard was salt and peppered. He was all man, and he didn't smell all that good. It was a tender sight, watching him react to Azure. His eyes got a little misty. I wish old Zeb was here to see this beautiful little creature. He would just love this baby like I do he said. Little Dove patted Oliver on the back and took the baby and slipped off in the shadows to feed her. It was a domestic scene that tugged at Oliver and Finn's hearts. We've got to find Rattlesnake and make him pay for what he did to the people on this wagon train and for killing your baby girl. The son of a bitch has to pay. I want to carve out his black heart, 
Oliver said. Suddenly, the earth began to shake, and they could hear a thunderous roar from off in the distance. A herd of buffalo crossed the trail 200 yards in front of them, then ascended a hogback and disappeared from sight. I've never seen such a sight, Finn said. What a spectacle. They were massive. Oliver shook his head in agreement. There must have been a hundred of them. So many running together is a rare sight here in Wyoming. There ain't near as many buffalo here in Wyoming, up in Montana or over in Washington. The major herds are in the Midwest, out there on the prairies. When I was back in Kansas, I watched a herd pass by that must have numbered around 10,000. The Indians have relied on the buffalo over the centuries. They use every part of a buffalo for teepees, clothing, moccasins, food, tools, and they even use their intestines to carry water. Now you just watch. In the near future, Easterners are going to come pouring westward and they'll kill off the mighty herds. Then there will be hell to pay between the Indians and the whites. That will be a danged shame, Finn said. Would you like me to tell you a few things I know about buffalo? Can I stop you? Finn asked, chuckling. Finn had come to realize that Oliver loved to talk, to speak on subjects unknown to most. Nope. What you'll find out about me is that sometimes I like to yammer. It can get mighty lonely in these mountains from time to time. Here goes. The beasts can oftentimes run up to 1,900 pounds, and they can run 35 miles an hour, so never try to outrun one. Finn laughed. Is that all? Nope. They have poor eyesight, but they have a good sense of smell. Their tail is sometimes three feet long, and when it's hanging down swatting flies, don't worry. But if it's positioned straight up, they're mad and you'd best watch out. The calves are born red, but they eventually turn brown. Where do you get these facts? Finn asked. I read it somewhere. I forget where. If the lesson's over, we should ride, Finn said. Little Dove put Azure in the cradle board, and Finn helped her strap it to her back. I should be the one toting Azure around, not you. I am bigger and stronger, Finn said. No way, Little Dove said. It's the squaw's work to take care of the little ones. While they rode, Finn glanced around the countryside. He'd never seen anything so beautiful than the Jackson Hole region. It was sucked in by a magnificent range of mountains that reached great heights, and the jagged peaks looked like they were teeth gnawing at the clouds. Then there was the lush green meadows undulating across the plain, rippling with a gentle breeze. Along the fringes of the Snake River Valley, a variety of trees grew, including aspen, cottonwood, ash, and elm. Finn thought the Jackson Hole region must closely approximate what heaven looks like. They rode for the remainder of the day and did not catch up with Rattlesnake and his cutthroat companions, nor did they reach Pierre's Hole, the site of the forthcoming 1,832 Rendezvous. They set up camp with Snow King Mountain as a backdrop. It was a mountain where the snow never melted. Finn and Oliver set up the camp took all of their horses to water, and built a fire. Then while they hobbled their horses so they wouldn't to wander off, Little Dove cooked their supper consisting of venison, fry bread, wild rice, seago lily bulbs, and piping hot coffee. While they ate, they watched a coterie of prairie dogs stand by their holes. Then at some imperceptible signal, they would all dive into their holes. But after a while, Curiosity would get the best of them, and they'd climb back out to look over the three humans. They're annoyed that we have invaded their territory, Oliver said. Notice those white tails, but the prairie dogs in eastern Wyoming have black tails. I don't know why. Where'd you hear that? Finn asked. I don't remember. Could a man kill a batch of them, cook them up and eat them? Finn asked. A man would have to be really hungry. Their meat is like chewing rubber. So you've eaten prairie dog? 
Yep, old Zeb and I were up on the picket wire, and Pert and I starved to death one winter. Sorry, it sounds like you and Zeb went through a lot together over the years, both good and bad, Finn said. You have no idea. Well, let's get some should I, partner. He thought it would make Oliver happy to know he had fully accepted him as one of them. Oliver beamed when he found out Finn had at last put his trust in him. Look, those prairie dogs have come out of their holes again. They're kind of cute. Oliver held up an index finger, indicating he just thought of something concerning the prairie dog. A coterie usually includes two males, three females, and six to twelve pups. Well, aren't you full of semi-useless information? Now, how do you come to know something like that? I don't remember. They bedded down for the evening and the following morning they were awakened by a hell of a commotion. It turned out two braying donkeys and a pack stuffed with pots, pans, and utensils jolted about as the pack mule walked. Hello, the camp, one of the riders said. Could we stop and have breakfast with you? We're plumb tuckered out and powerful hungry. We've been riding all night, a smallish black fellow said. Both mountain men were black. One was tiny, and the other was a mountain of a man with large, clearly defined muscles. They were dressed in buckskins and wearing moccasins. Their clothing had seen lots of wear, but they were both relatively clean. The large black man had braided his hair, and it was hanging to the middle of his back. His hair wasn't at the kinky type, so one of his parents must have been Caucasian because his hair was without any kink to it whatsoever. The smaller fellow's hair was kinky and cut close to his skull. The donkeys were having a fit because they smelled the water in the Yellowstone River. Take your donkeys to water, then come back and we'll talk, Finn said. The two black men headed for the river. A frisky foal followed the donkeys to the river. One of the donkeys must have been its mother. It was kicking up its heels and bucking. Both mountain men were riding donkeys, and they had a donkey for a pack animal loaded with a huge amount of cooking gear. They returned from the river and the large black man asked, What's chances you could spot us to a little grub? We ain't it for nigh on three days. Why? Finn asked. We plumb run out of grub, the large black man said. These mountains are full of game animals. Why didn't you shoot a deer or something? We was afraid of bringing engines down on us. These here hills are full of crow, ute, and a cineboin. Do you realize how stupid that statement is? Those pots and pans banging around on that pack donkey could alert Indians from miles around. Hmm, never thought of that. What's your names? I am Deshaun Williams, and this little feller is Jamal Horner. We hail from New Orleans. We came west to make a fortune in beaver fur, but we discovered we ain't so good at trapping. We caught all of three beaver all last summer. So we went to the rendezvous and bought all these pots and pans so we could sell them to the trappers. Not a damn one of them would buy so much as one pan from us. Say. You wouldn't happen to need some cooking utensils, would you? Nope. Well, what about that grub? Could you see fit to feed us this morning? Yes, Finn said, but then I want you to move on without us. Plainly put, we don't know you, so we don't trust you. That's not very friendly, now is it? No, it isn't, Finn said, but truth to tell, we ain't too good at socializing. All right, then. The big black man said, We'll take that breakfast and skedaddle. Little Dove set to work making a big breakfast. I have some advice for you, Oliver said. You can take it or leave it. It makes no never mind to me. What's that? Deshaun asked. If you fancy holding on to your top knots, you will get rid of the pots and pans. They make such a racket that the Indians will be able to hear you from miles around. Not on your life. We intend on selling them when we get back to New Orleans. All right, that's up to you, Oliver said. 
But why are you riding donkeys? They are all we have. We can't afford horse flesh. Oliver just shook his head. I'm not sure those little donkeys have the strength to carry you all the way to New Orleans. Yes, they will. They carried us out here. After breakfast, Deshaun and Jamal thanked them for the breakfast. That's the best grub we've had for a long time. Thank you, Deshaun said. Now we'll go down and fetch our donkeys and pull out of here. You're welcome. Stay safe, Finn said. While Finn, Oliver, and Little Dove broke down their camp, their two guests were up to some mischief. They left the donkeys and saddled two riding horses, and they loaded all of Oliver's beaver furs on a pack horse and they hit the trail. But before they left, they scattered the rest of the horses so they couldn't be followed, at least for a while, which would give them ample time to make their getaway. Before they rode away, Deshaun stopped his horse and took aim at Little Dove. She was at the river's edge washing dishes. The fifty caliber ball skidded alongside her head and knocked her unconscious. Then Deshaun and Jamal put their horses to a trot that would eat up the miles because they knew that Finn and Oliver would eventually catch up a couple horses and get after them. Look at that! They stole our horses and my beaver plues, Oliver said. Never mind that. I think they might have killed Little Dove, Finn said. They rushed down to the river and found Little Dove floating down the river face down. The current wasn't all that strong, so she was drifting away slowly. Finn didn't hesitate. He sprinted to the river, dived in, and swam toward her. He caught her and turned her over so she could breathe, providing she was still alive. He put his fingers to her neck and found a pulse and he thanked the Lord it felt strong. He figured she just might be knocked unconscious. He could see a streak of blood on the side of her head. Then it happened. They got entangled in a sweeper, an ancient spruce that toppled into the river but was still anchored to the bank by its roots. The current sucked them both under and Finn struggled mightily to untangle them from the branches and get to the surface for air, but it seemed like the harder he fought, the more entangled they became. They were underwater for several minutes, and Finn had taken water into his lungs. He suffered terribly from lack of oxygen, and he was right on the brink of going unconscious. Oliver scrambled out onto the spruce and used his hawk to cut away the branches holding Finn and Little Dove underwater. Suddenly, Finn and Little Dove floated away from the tree and popped up. Finn sucked in the air, the wonderful air, but his recovery was slow because his lungs were compromised by the water and he passed out. Little Dove was unconscious, and Finn wondered if she was dead. If he lost her, he felt he would never recover from the loss. He loved the tiny squad a distraction. Oliver plunged into the water and caught hold of Finn and Little Dove and dragged them to the shore. It took a Herculean effort, but he managed to tug them onto the bank. But he couldn't go to work on them right away because he laid panting and shaking in a patch of sand. He was spent. When Oliver recovered adequately, he rolled Little Dove onto her back and went to work to revive her. She had stopped breathing. He figured she was in the most critical condition so he should attend to her first. There was no time to be delicate, so he pushed in on her chest with the palms of his hands and tried to start her breathing again. It didn't to work, so he pinched off her nose and put his lips to hers and blew his breath into her. This went on for what seemed an interminable length of time, but she laid there inert, not moving, and her lips had turned blue. He gave up on her, and he turned his attention to Finn. The chest compressions worked on him right away, and his eyes popped open, and he spit up a lot of water. As soon as Finn gathered his wits, he thought of Little Dove. How is Little Dove? he asked. She isn't. Yes, Finn, I am afraid she is dead. I worked with her for a long time, but I couldn't bring her around. No, no, it can't be. My Little Dove can't be dead. What about our baby? Our little Azure. What will happen to her? 
He leaped to his feet and kneeled by Little Dove's side. He compressed her chest savagely. Then he blew his breath into her in mighty bursts. He was frantic. Then her eyes popped open and she spit up a large amount of water. Her reviving like that seemed miraculous. I hate telling you this, but a doctor friend of mine told me that when the brain is starved of oxygen for as little as five minutes, it can cause damage. I hope she's all right. My brain's just fine, Little Dove said, but I've got a bad headache. Finn caught her up in his arms and nearly crushed her. I don't know what I would have done without you. I'm not sure I could have gone on. Don't be silly. Of course you could have gone on. You're a strong man. Let's get after Deshaun and Jamal, she said. You are not going anywhere, Finn said. You were in no shape to ride? Yes, I am. They shot me, and I am going to make them pay for it. Finn cut his eyes over to Oliver, looking for help. Let's ride, Oliver said. There's no arguing with a mad squaw. It took them about an hour to catch up to three of their horses, and they got on Deshaun and Jamal's trail. Azure was tucked away in the cradle board and riding on Little Dove's back. They short-loped their horses for miles upon miles, and late in the afternoon they caught sight of the culprits. Deshaun and Jamal were on a side hill, traversing a trail that looked like an eyebrow along the side of the hill. They had stopped their horses to give them a blow, and Finn got off of his horse and took careful aim at Deshaun, because he was a bigger target. The black men looked like they were about 300 yards away. The big 50 caliber roared and Deshaun toppled from his horse. The ball took him through the spine, and he hit the ground and never moved. Jamal panicked, and he kicked his horse in the ribs and put him into a full-out run. When the horse tried to round a bend in the trail, it lost its footing and man and horse went over the side. The horse kept going and dropped onto a field of boulders in the bottom of the canyon. Jamal's descent somehow was stopped when he fell onto a little lip on the side of the hill. But he was in a precarious situation. If he even breathed wrong, he would continue falling to the boulders 200 feet below. Please throw me a rope, he said. Just pull me up and let me go, and you will never see me again. No, Finn said. You're going to die. You are as worthless as a bucket of buzzard puke. No, no, please, Jamal pleaded. Please, I am so scared. They could see him trembling, even though they were a good fifty feet above him. Finn cut his eyes to Little Dove. Do you want to do the honors? He asked. Would it make your headache even worse? Maybe, but I don't care. Finn had reloaded the Hawken, so he handed it to her. Hold it firm against your shoulder, and you know it is going to kick you like a mule? I don't care. She took careful aim and pulled the trigger. She missed by a couple inches, but she hit a large boulder that was holding Jamal up. The rock exploded and down he went. He screamed all the way down, and the scream diminished in volume as he descended. He hit the boulders below and it broke his body. He was sort of like Humpty Dumpty, the shattered egg from the fairy tale. This concludes part two of Finn Sullivan Mountain Man, Rattlesnake, book two by author Scotty V. Casper, published by Dusty Saddle Publishing. Thank you for joining us on our read and stay tuned for part three. Pick up more from Scotty V. Casper on Amazon, available on Kindle and paperback. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you have enjoyed listening to this story. Until next time.